if you watched the previous video, then you know I did a flashback session where the players met Ispen Greenshield and one another at the Kingfisher Festival five years earlier. And I intercut that with the parts in the book Scales of War and uh, Breaking the Silence uh, so that it was broken up between going back and forth between the past and present. So I began the second session in the past as one of the characters was remembering a time they raided uh, the Kobold Temple. And what I broke that down last night to make room on my table. So I'm going to take you through that in, uh, in photos. And what I did was I used a Pathfinder flip map, which had a great chasm and different levels of terrain. But I added some 3D elements, including the GameStop Dice Tower, which represents the demonic statue on the Dave Trampier Player's Handbook for Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. I also used some... Dwarven Forge and mostly printable scenery, uh, cavern pieces to create walls and the Dwarven Forge bridge going across the chasm uh, to create this dynamic flashback. It was it was just kind of a fun way to open up the, the session with a combat. And the combat was actually pretty fun <laughs> because um, the, the players, I, I also introduced a couple other NPCs along with their party and, you know, who actually died during that battle. And I wanted them to die. This is some advice here as a DM because I wanted them to feel as though they had been an adventuring party and that there is the danger of death. Um, one, one of the NPCs fell on a collapsing uh, floor that dropped him into the chasm. My youngest son, who's playing a dwarf ranger, he slipped and fell. He was holding on to the edge. Uh, and my wife, who's playing a kender, <laughs> she was uh, berating him for, for slipping and falling. And then she rescued him uh, using a magic item, a homebrewed magic item that I gave last week. Uh, instead of like trying to pull him up, she pried one of his fingers that was clutching onto the cliff's edge and slipped on a ring of misty step <laughs> and, and he was able to get out of it. So after the flashback, uh, as you can see from these pictures, um, although I wasn't certain at the time that my son or my nephew, were, they were going to be able to play. So in these pictures, their minis aren't there, but they are included now in the campaign Dwarf Ranger and a stunted uh, minotaur barbarian uh, who was cast out of his homeland uh, for being malformed. And he was uh, actually part of the the Kingfisher Festival in the first session we had uh, where, where a corrupt dwarf was uh, bringing him as a sideshow freak and doing a game of ring toss on his horns. So it was good to have a full table last night. So we opened up with that first uh flashback encounter before they all arrived at Vogler. And here is the map of Vogler that I put up, detailing Thornwall Keep, the entrance, the different locations. This is the area that I had set up in the flashback festival. And then here's the Brass Crab where the funeral is supposed to take place. You can see the general shape of it, and it was the inspiration for what I did, which I will show you now. So here is the brass crab, and I largely used WizKids Warlock tiles to create an outside patio, a kitchen and storeroom, the main tap room, and I didn't have enough of their stuff, so I did use some Dwarven Forge Tudor buildings for the rooms. I like these little um, wardrobes and chests from Tiny Furniture. We have some bunk beds from WizKids. We have some tables from Galadoria Games, as well as WizKids. Love this one from Galadoria Games. Look at that. And the bar setup is from WizKids. And I've got, as well as the minis. I, I got these seated minis on Etsy. But I love the, you got the barmaids, 
They're from WizKids, as well as the minis behind the bar. Some kitchen stuff from WizKids, an assortment from WizKids, as well as Etsy. I love that little sink. Now, these docks and these light posts are from Galadoria Games for their city docks. And I use these Dragonlance minis. In my game, I made Becklin a male. I wanted to go a little more traditional, and I made him... Uh, an older retired male, so I used this figure, this Salamnic Knight for Becklin. I kept the name. Then you've got this human of Anzalon, who was playing music and singing. An assortment of people, including Bacaris the Younger, or Bacaris, and then here's the party. This is Lidara, a mysterious elf mourner and this is Ranulf and I'll explain who Ranulf is in a moment and there is I used a web wrapped um, mini to be Ispin's corpse now the ore in there is from the first his homage to this character the fighter with the halberd who used a wooden oar in the fighting arena in the melee competition that he was partnered with Ispin in the first session. Now, so far, I really am enjoying this adventure. I've enjoyed reading it, and I think it's solid, but I think it needs work. And that's why I did the flashback sequence for the players to meet at the, at the Kingfisher Festival and to meet Ispin and to pepper in with some of their adventures when they were, you know, prior to this uh, five year later present time when they're coming to attend their friend's funeral. Now, I also wanted to do something different. I, I was listening to uh, some other GMs and what they do for uh, what they've done with their campaigns. And I thought, okay, well, I knew out of the gate that the shield wasn't going to be the only gift. I felt like, you know, the things that they had collected previously in their adventures, like he would, he would have some sort of, you know, gift for each of them. But the shield itself, <clears throat> you know, it was supposed to be a gift from a unicorn. I heard somebody suggest, you know, giving it the unicorn's healing power. But I didn't want to do healing power because we already have a cleric. I want to keep that special. But... I wanted to beef up Consaldi Fire Eyes, and actually I'm going to call it Consaldi Fire Eye because it's really only one eye that's, uh, you know, enchanted. And so Consaldi is obsessed with finding relics from, you know, Istar's past and, and things like that. So what I did was I had uh, them receive word that Ispin was dead. They went to, to look at the corpse earlier in the day to, to examine it because what they heard was that he was killed by an ogre. They don't tell you in the book how Ispin died. So, you know, which I feel, again, part of me is like, why didn't they do that? But then another part of me is like, you know what? I like they didn't because then I don't feel hemmed in. I can let my creativity run wild. So I had it that Ispin uh, was allegedly slain by an ogre. His face smashed in beyond all recognition. So they went to look at the body and the, you know, players always will throw things in that you don't expect. Like, oh, well, I knew this person. Did I, do they have any distinguishing marks on their body that I could recognize? So I, you know, without missing a beat, I was like, you know what? You do remember that he had a strawberry on the back of his neck. However, you know, so when they looked, the, the wound was such that like the face was caved in, so you couldn't recognize the face, but it also like broke the neck and there was discoloration. So it was in doubt. There was the beginning seeds of doubt whether this was really Ispin. And so at the funeral, I had 
you know, spoiler alert, uh, I had Ispin still alive. It made more sense to me for him to be alive. Um, I want, I wanted that to be a shock to them. And so I had him posing as Ranulf, uh, this old timer who was to the side watching the funeral. He was the one who allegedly brought the body back with the story of how Ispin met his death. So it was pretty hilarious because the Kender, like I had her notice. So as a DM, I don't always want to make players roll for um, a perception if I want them to notice something. You know, because what if they roll low? If they roll low, then I'm just gonna be like, okay, well, you think you wanted to see something, but you didn't see it. That's That's lame. So instead, I wanted the Kendra to see it. So I said to my wife, I said, all right, Dottie notices this, the man uh, who's standing over there is bearded and sometimes he's laughing at the tales being told. Sometimes he's crying. And one of the times when he's kind of wiping his eyes, uh, it looks to you like his beard almost pulls off his face a bit. And then you see him quickly put it back on. So uh, this, you know, provided a clue that this person is not who he seems to be. So she went over and she was like asking him, are you an actor? And, and uh, you know, I've never met an actor before. And and he said, that's nonsense. And she said, but your beard is fake. So he started to to, to flee and escape and uh, actually used her name. And uh, which was, you know, again, a little clue. So uh, then others started to come to see what the commotion was. So he quickly threw down his pouch, scattering things to uh, be of interest to the Kender and then fled into the tavern, into his room and out of the window. And while that was happening, we had Bacchus who was drunk and, and heckling the, the people in the crowd started poking fun at the Minotaur and poking fun of the dwarf and his bald head. And the dwarf who smokes a cigar um, <laughs> got up in his face. And since the uh, Bacchus had been drinking quite a bit, uh, the dwarf blew a bunch of cigar smoke in his face. And I had I had uh, Bacchus roll a constitution save, which he failed miserably. And he bent over the pier and started vomiting. And the dwarf laughed uproariously at him. It was a very funny moment. Little wins like that for your players you know, they love it, they'll remember it. And, you know, you got to put them to task sometimes and, you know, but like give them these moments and they'll they'll remember it, they'll love it and really play up Bacchus to be obnoxious. He's not necessarily brave. He's just really spoiled, used to having his own way. So lean into that and have fun as he continues to berate them. It, it'd be interesting. Actually, my players were pretty restrained. Nobody got physical with him. And uh, he actually got shamed into uh, leaving. The Kender also stole a pouch of steel pieces for him. If you're not aware, steel pieces are the equivalent of gold in Dragonlance. It's very precious. I use this mini for Cudgel Iron Smile, the head of the Ironclad Regiment, the Mercenaries. Uh, and the mercenary friend of Becklin and Ispin. And I used a very bad Scottish accent. I'm terrible at it, but I told my players to imagine that I was doing a really good accent. <laughs> and she really took a shine to the wizard. And they, they shared uh, some drinks and tales. And so this is an opportunity to play up these NPCs so that they have a relationship that grows and develops throughout the campaign. There's some really great advice uh, on the YouTube channel, how to be a great GM. And one of the pieces of advice that I took from him was you have Lidara, who is this mysterious elf that has some information that can be coaxed out of her. Don't bother. Give them the information. Put them on the trail. The, uh, and you know that Lord Soth is a growing threat and a danger. And and I did just that. I actually, they arranged to meet with her later after the funeral. Um, but prior to that, they, they ended up um, meeting up with Ispin and realizing that their friend was alive. And he explained to them that he 
staged his own death when his messenger and uh, guide, Ranulf, was killed by uh, an ogre. So, and who t he, so he traded places with him. And it's because he's been being sought after because he had raided Dargard Keep where Lord Soth is. He witnessed him raising a death dragon and was saved from the death dragon attack by grabbing a shield in the treasure hoard and using it. Uh, this shield he then took to paint up green and look like his old shield. And he... Uh, and he fled, and he's been being pursued um, because this is uh, an Istarian relic, and Kinsaldi Fireeye is after him for this relic, and Lord Soth is after him for revenge. So uh, Lidara kind of ties in and confirms uh, the story by she by revealing the rest of the unknown story of uh, the Knight of the Black Rose, Lord Soth. They knew up to a point. They knew hints of the seriousness of his crimes, but they didn't know how far they went, and they didn't know what, why he failed the mission to stop the cataclysm. If you don't know it, look that up. It's a really tragic and great story. So she was able to fill them in on that. And um, what they don't know is they don't know that she is a ghost, one of the elves that is meant to torment Lord Soth uh, for eternity. Uh, and I didn't want to reveal that. So, she, you know, they, they kind of asked about her interest and she said that she had, she was a kindred of one of the elves. So that, you know, Lord Soth slew. So she will be in touch with them and she'll show up later in the campaign, ultimately revealing the true nature of herself, which should be a shock. Now, so they're shocked about Ispin being back. And that's great because making sure nobody uh, in my house can hear, I'm gonna have him die when the dragon army marches on Vogler. And that'll probably be next session. I think reminding your players, you know, in a, in a nice way that, you know, this is, a pre-written campaign, you know, you let them know you're you're making it your own. You're going to take an account, you know, the, the personalities and the backstories, but have the ask them to lean into the story so that they get the most out of it. I think uh, my players are are doing just that. They did do a lot of what they wanted to do. The session where they returned to Vogler and have the day prior to the funeral is really sandboxy. They're able to go and visit places, talk to people, do things, um, and probably things you don't expect. So just be prepared maybe with uh, some NPCs. If you got a Kender in your party, make sure that you have some tables or something set or just be really good at improvising, you know, the reactions if they're caught thieving, uh, items, you know, what I do is I refer to the trinket table in the player's handbook. And actually, my wife is going to get a pouch. And I told her to randomly pick, you know, 25 things from the trinket table. And she's going to write them on little pieces of paper and stuff them in her pouch. So that, like, you know, when she's trying to grab for something and find things, like, you know, it's she's she's grabbing and pulling out and looking, you know, when she was trying to rescue the dwarf from falling into the chasm. Uh, you know, she sat down and she started going through her pouches looking for rope. So, you know, it, it took a, it took a couple rounds before she put the ring on. So it, it created, there was this tension that was created, but it was also playful in a way that Dragonlance should be. Dragonlance can be emotional. It can be uh, scary. It can be serious. But, you know, when, when I think back to like Tasselhoff and Flint, you know, or, you know, if you've read The Brothers Magier and Earbreak Lockpicker in relation to Raceland and Garamond, there are moments in the middle of the craziness that really make it fun and, and more importantly, fun for your players. They'll, they'll remember it. They'll laugh. They'll think it's awesome. Let people do things they wouldn't normally do, you know, with this campaign. Like, you know, like I had a, um, 
the, the Minotaur in early on was running to get to the, the bad guy, but he, could, he couldn't quite get there. So he wanted to run, oh, because he was levitating. The, the Kobold Sorcerer was levitating. So the Minotaur wanted to kind of run up the fighter and, and leap up. And I was like, oh yeah, sure. You guys have adventured together before. Uh, so you're prepared for this. You, you know what? When he comes, give me an athletics check and throw him up there. And, and so um, he had to do an athletics check. It went really good. But I wanted an acrobatics check from uh, from the Minotaur. He rolled a one, so he actually flipped up and landed in the fire in the brazier, and so it it became kind of a comical moment. You know, he knew he wasn't uh, gonna gonna perish, but it was it was pretty funny. So keep keep room for some lively, fun, and playful moments in the campaign, and just really work hard at like making it memorable for your players. And I think they're going to love this campaign. This session was really like almost four hours of role playing. And I thought I was going to get to the Battle of High Hill. I didn't. And I did take another piece of advice from how to be a great GM. So when they were on the water, I instead of being on the docks for uh, the fishing competition, you know, because later they're going to have need and the players are going to need to realize there's lots of fishing boats as the as the um, villagers escape and flee and evacuate as the army invades. So I wanted to, like, put that in their, their head so they knew. And so I made, I followed how to be a great GM's advice and the fishing competition took place on boats in the water. So here are some boats and the players on a boat. So... And like how to be a great gym uh, did, I had Derek come out and bring them sandwiches and a flagon of milk and just show his love and appreciation. I really made sure to play him up to be a, like a very likable guy who his goal is to restore the honor of knighthood and that, uh, you know, really has a great appreciation for the players themselves. So um, the competition, this is a great opportunity for some competition between the players as they're catching. The Kender almost went twice overboard with rolls of one on survival check. And then like how a great GM, to be a great GM uh, suggested, I had a giant octopus, a river, a freshwater octopus <laughs> attack them. So we ended with a great bit of um, combat uh, leading up to where they would take their rest before making their way to the next session, which is going to have to wait two weeks, unfortunately. Um, but for good reason, I uh, have guests coming from out of town. So we'll, we'll explore this setup next time. For this setup, this is a WizKids uh, map. And it's like a shallow lake map or underground lake, whatever. Look on their website. They have really good mats. And I really like the, the, that it's gridded. And I really like kind of the, the shimmering quality. This is uh, the minis here. This is a, a mini from, from WizKids. We got a couple hero forges in here. The, the dwarf and the minotaur, but the cleric and, uh, oh, and, the, the wizard back here is Hero Forge, but the but the Kender and the Cleric are and the Octopus are all whiz kids. A couple Dwarven Forge boats. And then we've got a boat from Amber's Secret Cove. That's an Etsy shop. A resin boat. So did a couple monster fight club trees up there just to Dress it up. That's a Pathfinder cobblestone map. And so that's that's the setup. I clearly thought I was going to get to other things, but that will wait uh, until next time. So the morning after the funeral, the players went to see Sir Becklin who presented them each with gifts. And I made these like fun items, not overly powerful. You know, for example, the Kendra got a gray bag of tricks. Uh, there was a horn of silent warning. There was a helmet of command. 
uh, however, you know, just some 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 trifles, some some things that enhance the player's care, uh, abilities, but doesn't overpower them. For example, I created a staff for my brother's wizard that he got called the Warding Staff, and it allows him to use his reaction to cast shield. Once used that way, he can't use it again until he takes a long rest. However, he can spend hit dice to gain additional functions of the staff, which is which is cool because he can use it more, but it costs him his very essence, at least until the next day. So uh, just some, some cool items just to get them on their way. And I ended up giving the shield that Ispin took from Dargard Keep, the one that saved him from the, the Death Dragon's breath weapon. And that was a shield given to the Minotaur. And so that shield, uh, it reduces any, it basically gives him resistance to necrotic damage and any uh, target attacks, spell attacks that deal necrotic damage are at disadvantage to hit him. So they each got uh, a gift and now they're getting ready. They, they're, they're, they're already aware of the hints of war. They know Lord Soth is a threat. They know there is a great general on the move. And uh, so they're starting to get concerned. However, they are preparing to go to the Battle of High Hill, the recreation, uh, where they'll be taking up the role of the Salamic Knights. And, and, then, uh, and then things will unfold from there. So I'm really looking forward to the next session and getting back to it as we dive deeper into Dragonlance Shadow of the Dragon Queen. Uh, if you like this video, please like, share, and subscribe. Tell your friends. Follow me on Instagram for extra XP. And if you haven't already seen the previous video, go ahead and watch it. This is going to be in a playlist uh, where I'm going to do this uh, for each session. Take care. Catch you next time.